Welcome to the post game podcast for game two, where the Raptors have tied the series at 1 1, defeating the Indiana Pacers 98 87. And joining me today is Sam Holako. Hey, man. Hey, man. How are you? I'm glad you waited up for me. <laughs> uh, pretty good, man. A lot better than I was after game one. Uh, Absolutely. This one was a welcome sign. Norman Powell. Norman Powell. Let's talk about Norman Powell, man. That's all I'm well, saying. Norman Powell, and you go. That's. That's all you have to say. Uh, what was he? He was plus twenty five on the night. I thought he played. I thought he played pretty good defense on Paul George. He hustles a lot. He hit a three. Um, I believe he hit a three. He did. Yeah, he hit a three. Yeah, yeah, he hit a three. I just, uh, I, I like him, man. It would have been interesting to see if he started. Uh, I missed a couple minutes of the in the first and that fifteen two run in the second, but. Um, I thought I thought if you brought him, if you started him and then brought in uh, Demar Carroll quick ish, that could have been an interesting combination. But yeah, man, look, he's legit, man. He's legit. It's 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 like he was easily all night long. He was the um, the best defender the Raptors had, the best wing defender the Raptors had, and he was the yep. uh, the Paul George struggled against him, and that's saying something, man. This is a second round pick, a rookie struggle like who made a you know a perennial all-star struggle and um you know the raptors tried demario carroll on paul george he did okay demar Derozan on paul george he got destroyed again uh but uh norman powell man he he was the one who caused paul uh, a lot of frustration man you could see he was visibly frustrated and he was looking at the bench and looking at the officials to get the call but you know powell held his own and and, and really he's he's playing with like an aura for like a 10-year vet well, I mean, that's that's what that's what what was happening with people coming out of uh, college back in the '90s and early 2000s. If you don't if you don't remember, right? Yeah. They used to play three, four years. You go through the entire program. Uh, you become a seasoned veteran. People are counting on you in your senior season. And you come into the NBA, and that transition isn't as difficult. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't been seeing that a lot in the last, you know, ten years or so. Yeah. But here's a guy who uh, draft NBA Draft.net said they had as a first round pick all the way up to the draft and he somehow fell to 46. Yeah. Uh, he came out of a great program and he's just showing what uh, getting one, getting mentorship, getting a proper education in, in college will do for you. Uh, a, a basketball education. Like completely unfazed by the occasion and like everything he does on the court is just so thought out. Like his, 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 the, he, he doesn't take bad shots. His drives are always measured. He's never out of control. His defense is sound. Like he's always in good rebounding position. Sure. Always boxes out his guy. Like you fundamentals from like one to ten, he has got it all. And then, and, and all the, but the best part is that he, he doesn't look like a rookie at all. Like you, when if you watch the game, you would not have thought that this guy is a rookie. Absolutely not. Uh, you know, he, he's a little bit more. He's a little bit more. Uh, he's not as polished offensively as you'd like, but. The way he moves on the court, he's got some swagger. He's super yeah. serious. Yeah. I like that nickname for yeah. him, Mr. Serious. I like that too. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't like nicknames, yeah. for it, but that one, that one kind of fits. Yeah, yeah, that totally fits. Yeah, but but let's talk about the uh, starting lineup change. Uh, Demari Carroll uh, was introduced as the uh, starter to obviously guard Paul George, and he guarded him, and he picked up like two quick fouls, uh, which uh, meant that Dwayne Casey had to pull him off to the bench. And um, so it didn't really matter. The starting lineup change didn't really have an effect because you eventually end up starting Powell on. On, uh, on 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 George just anyway. by, after two minutes, yeah. So whatever, l l let that slide. Um, the Raptors though immediately built up a pretty solid lead, uh, and I gotta say, man, the lineup that built that lead, and I post this in my quick reaction, was like Ross, who had two big threes in that run, Jonas Valanciunas, yep. who was dominating the glass, uh, it's just Corey Joseph, who was just making uh, Ty Lawson look silly. A big 16-point lead, I think the Raptors had, and at that point, you're like, "Yeah, we're coasting, man." Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, most of the league made Ty, made Ty Lawson silly for the last two seasons, but um, I I liked I liked how Ross came out. He uh, he he had a shot going definitely, um, but but he he worked into it right. So like he was a little timid at first. He got some nice plays in, made some nice defensive defensive stops, a nice swing pass to two pat. Tupat returned a favor to him on the next possession. Then he hit another pull up, pull up three, and before he smashed his head into DeRozan's face, he was he he was looking to have a really nice game. Yeah, um, 
And then well, there's, a, there's a big lead here the Raptors have. It looks like we're coasting. And then DeMar DeRozan gets reintroduced back into the game. And this is what makes, like, I can live with the, or I can't live. I can somewhat eke by with him shooting 5 for 18 again. Uh, but his defense, man, in that first half was so poor. I, I, Monta Ellis just ate him up in transition in one-on-one. -on -one. Paul George went at him and scored. He was doing he was doing negative things on offense and even worse on defense. It made no sense to have that guy on the court. And I was surprised he was on the court as long as he was in the second quarter because he is to me the reason that Indiana came back to like five points towards the end of the end of the end of the first half. Well, both those guys are really bad matchups for DeRozan, I feel. I yeah. mean, Monte Ellis in his old age is still super, super quick off the bounce. And uh and Paul George is I mean, he's he's just tough for anybody to send. Yeah. Um I don't know. I, I I don't know. I don't know where DeRozan is. Like he he's trying hard. He has no space to operate. Um, he had a little bit in the third quarter there. Or was it the fourth where he had the the two quick jumpers? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's just. I don't know where he is. He. I I think he's just putting way too much pressure on himself. Yeah. To make something happen. Like he's been here too long. I think is what it is. He's just he's just trying to exercise the Toronto demons in the playoffs and 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 it's just getting to his head. He 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 doesn't need to do that because he has a lot of help. He's not on a Chris Bosh team where he's the only of, half decent yeah. player. We got good players on this team. You don't need to do that. And like Jack Armstrong actually said like he's basically a company man through and through, right? But he even he at one point goes like DeRozan is your worst perimeter defender. You got to do everything to hide him. You, you can't have him guard Paul George or Monta Ellis. Basically, you have to orient your lineup so that DeRozan's defense is hidden. And as sad as that sounds, that was that was ex exactly what needed to be done. But we'll get to that fourth quarter benching of DeRozan just uh, just in a bit. But uh, contrast this with Kyle Lowry, who had who struggled again from the line or from the from the floor, four for thirteen Thank or you. eighteen points. But looking at his he game, he started slow. He's, but you don't even care, like because that's not yeah. his thing. Like he did so many other things, yeah. like the way he penetrated, he the way so he tight. handled the ball, yeah. the way he, like you know, the, when when uh, the Pacers pressured him, he just he was yeah. he was he sustained it really really well. And um, really well. The, the ten for ten free throws, the nine assists is just like you know icing on the cake. But his old demeanor throughout the game was composed. You can look past his four for thirteen shooting very easily, and you contrast it with Demar Derozan who. Essentially, the exact same thing he did in game one. Four shots, took the shots that the defense wanted him to take, and really didn't look to pass. He ended up with two assists playing 31 minutes. It, it, it's, it's, I hate to say this, man, but it's it's a very, very selfish game. I mean, I, he's a traditional shooting guard, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, Lowry got was able to get himself to the line. He was able to draw contact. Uh, you know, a couple of those were a little bit suspect. Uh, the calls that he got, but I mean, he's he's an all-star, so you're going to get those calls. The Rosen's not getting any calls. Yeah. So, you know, going five for 18 from the field for a shooting guard who is a streaky-ish shooting guard isn't terrible, but he did not go to the free throw line at all. Yeah. He He's not doing what he was doing earlier. Like, he, you know, he's pulling up a little early. He's putting his head down, going into the paint. He's not trying to draw contact on its face from what I see. See, until he does that, and he gets to the line, he gets some cheap fouls, uh, you know, easy points from the line. It's going to be really hard for him to score. To me, that's like 30% of it. And like 70% of it is, hey, this is the playoffs where teams have game planned for you. Like they know you like to pump fake yeah. four times before you take a shot. And they're not going to fall for the same tricks that they fell in game 35 of the regular season. It, it's, it's simple as that. And... And also, the, the Pacers also put a tremendous amount of pressure on, on DeRozan and Lowry because they, they, they knew that these two other sourced their offense. And what I, what I thought the Raptors did differently today was that when that initial pressure came, that initial double team came on Lowry or the help came, they were very, very good in releasing the ball early, especially Lowry. And you yeah. and you saw it getting worked around to Patrick Patterson, who was 5-for-6. Uh, Terrence Ross was 2-for-4. Corey Joseph was 6-for-8. I think that that was a big, big part of uh, – a big difference from game one. The, the, this, and, and it was yeah. early. Those, those, yeah. those, sorry, those those perimeter shots from Ross and Patterson yeah. came early yeah. uh, in the second, first and second quarter. So, you know, they were able to open up some space earlier on today than they were on Saturday. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, and, and that's that's not. And the, and the winning lineup for me here is when you have uh, Kyle Lowry, a ball yeah. handler. You have uh, Corey Joseph as well. And then you yeah. got um, uh, Norman Powell for defensive. And then you got Patrick Patterson, Bismack Biombo. That to me is is your like 
key lineup which can beat the Pacers. High amount of defense, good shooting, a lot of ball handling. The Pacers yep. like to help a lot. You get that lineup in there. Yeah, you give up a little bit of offense with Bismack Biombo, but overall, you're you're flying there. You're giving up a little bit with Powell, too. Um, you could easily put in JV in that lineup, too. Um, you know, give a little bit back on defense, but gain, you know, tremendously on the offensive side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, totally agree. I like that line. It's really mobile. Yeah. And, and we look at Powell. I gave him like an A-plus in the quick reaction and all. And um, yeah. w w when I look at That's his well line, done. it's like 22 minutes, one for six field goal, and, um, you know, three points. But in a playoff game, that's an A-plus because how well he defended Paul George. Block. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an amazing. Yeah, no, that's a Tony. He's, he's got the Tony Allen game. Yeah. He he. I, and you know what? It's going to be interesting. Uh, the NBA is going to start tracking defensive stats from next year, I believe, or from the playoffs this year. Yeah. So, so we're going to see, you know, guys like Norman Powell, what their true, true value to this team is. Yeah. No, I, absolutely. So, so third quarter starts, and, and DeMar DeRozan starts off with a couple of drives. I think he has one drive where the Indiana defense kind of fell off, and uh, he had a, a dunk, and he had a couple of uh, couple of jumpers there. And you think yeah. maybe he's he's getting it going, but at the same time, it's it's the defensive end that that causes the problems with him because he, he just can't stop anybody and, and you can't you can't afford to have him on out there. So I I'm confused like he these won't even glare. I mean he's he's never been that defender that people talk about right um you know he that's probably the weakest aspect of his game but I I don't feel like the Pacers are really doing anything to expose expose his defensive liabilities right I mean I just feel like they're they're going about their game plan, and um, he's he's just not engaged. I yeah. I don't know why. I he he he's too caught up in his own mind. I I think his stat line kind of resonates in his head after each missed shot, and he it's it, it's one of those like make till you miss, except like you're never making, and and it's just like a spiraling effect which just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And he's kind of hoping like to game. hit like five in a row, but it's just not happening. But what he has to do is really adopt the approach of Kyle Lowry because he can contribute in other ways. He had one nice drive where he kind of he drove and got, got the defense towards and dished it to JV for a dunk, which which was yeah. really his only like offensive positive today, other than that stretch I mentioned. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like, is there something else going on, it, or is it more complicated? I don't think so. No. What? Why do you think there is? I don't know. It just he, he he's not. He, now, I've, I've been a DeRozan fanboy forever, right? So um, he just doesn't seem like that guy. So, I mean, he's not getting it going offensively. But you never, ever questioned his work ethic. You never questioned, you know, that he didn't leave it all on the floor. Like, he's had bad games for long. You know, he's had a lot of them. But it, it was just bad games. It wasn't a, it wasn't a question of... Um, you know, desire. Let's say. No, right? I, I don't. And, I don't and, think his desire has and, dipped at all. I, I don't think it's that at all. Maybe man. not desire. Maybe that's the wrong. But it, you know, they're, you know, we, we we're never questioning him like this, right? I I mean, is it really surprising? Now he's on the big stage. Is is it really surprising that he's? We, we've always said all season long, or all last three years, that his game is one that is easy to lock down. Like if you force him to drive and you congest him, he doesn't have great handles to blow by you like Montalas does. You crowd him and he's gone. Like he, even even at the age of 55, he's he can blow by you. DeRozan doesn't have that. He doesn't have a jumper, which has been a huge problem for him. And now combine that with focus defense, a coach planning for you. Of course you're gonna struggle. I, this is not a surprising lineup for me. Uh, a surprising line for me. What is surprising for me isn't his shooting percentage. It's the fact that he's not doing anything else and that he's so poor yeah. defensively. Well, that's, what that's what I'm saying. So let me let me just totally jump ahead out of this game. Like, and maybe we'll come back to this later. But I just want to put this out there. Like, you can't let the Rosen walk in the in the off season. But you know, having him as your number two option on the team has a lot of has has a lot of drawbacks. So like you know, how much sleep is Ujiri losing right now? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think whatever you sign him at, there's yeah. always going to be some team like who's going to pay him the same amount of who money. Like this, this who's good, yeah. who might trade for him. So I I don't think it's a sunk cost if you uh, if you sign him. Uh, it, it's it's not like you're signing like Landry Fields or or, or freaking yeah. Yogi Stewart. I mean, this is a guy who's who has a reputation around the league. Yeah, he has some flaws, but I, I don't think he's a contract that will not be flippable if uh you know if if, if things don't work out. But let's jump to the fourth quarter, yeah, man. Sure. Sorry. 
It's um yeah. uh, fourth quarter. Let me check the score line at the start of the fourth. It was uh seventy four sixty six Raptors. Um, you know we had a bit of a run towards the end of the third, and uh, this lineup that I mentioned earlier of um. Uh, what was it? The the defensive lineup that we had. It was like Norman Lowry, Powell, course, Lowry, next, Joseph, uh, Biombo, and, and and Tupat. They were out there. No DeRozan, and they essentially increased the lead to like 15, 16 points in the fourth quarter. And Dwayne Casey resisted yep. the urge to bench uh, to bring back Demar DeRozan. We talked about pre podcast. A lot of balls. Yep. That's a, that's a huge call he made there, and that's one yep. that we both felt that he should have made in game one as well. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's the it's a, it's a similar situation. You got a guy who's a sieve defensively. You got a guy who's a good defender, Nolan Powell. What do you do? You go. He went back to his all star and he got killed. Here he didn't. He stuck with what's working. I call that learning on the part of Dwayne Casey. But man, it's great that he did that. But damn, man, that should have happened in game one. Yeah, it should have happened. It, it, it's also it's also uh, even though it should have happened, it took a lot of balls, man. Like. Yeah, so he, he he has some quotes coming out of the ball. he has some quotes coming out of the um his post game press conference. Uh, so Sam, why don't you keep talking while I look them up? Yeah, so I mean, um, the key was like I felt like it was win win. Um, that move was win win, right? Raptors had, you know, they had some momentum. They had you know a few point lead. Mm-hmm. You're not looking for Norm to um, to score and extend that lead. All you're looking for him is to try and control Paul George mm-hmm. and and make it really difficult for Indiana to mount any sort of run. Yeah. In the meantime, Lowry making big moves. I felt Patterson was really, really big in the fourth quarter. Yeah, okay. Th- thanks, for, th- thanks for filling that gap time, Sam. We got some quotes now. Uh, yeah. so Casey sounds confident in DeRozan bouncing back, uh, though maybe some frustration with calls. Uh, I don't think so, man. I, I think the refs are playing this one like totally fair. The refs are not even. A I mean, they made a couple game. rough ones, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's it both ways. It's both yeah. ways. It's both ways. Yeah. Uh, starting Carroll was a way to get him going. Uh, doesn't have to come in and shut down George once it's hot. Uh, I think he basically uh, Carroll was there to just get him a lift. Uh, KC on the second unit, uh, unity and chemistry. Corey was leading that charge. He's being the floor general. Other than that boneheaded yeah. play in the second quarter, I don't know which one that was. Uh, but yeah, I think I think Corey Joseph deserves some credit. But the guy we haven't talked about, man, is is Jonas Valanciunas. Yeah, uh, dude. I mean, everyone's been calling for him to get the ball for years now, right? Give him some run, give him the ball. Yeah. Indiana's got nobody to cover him in the post. He's big. He's he's really really active on the glass, and and he's visibly frustrating guys like Miles Turner. Right? In 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 for both teams, um, Bismack Biyombo and Jonas Valanciunas are two of the biggest and strongest guys for either team, and it is so yeah. evident during every single moment of the series because every rebound that goes up, the Raptors have a chance of getting it. And in this game, yeah, uh, they were 44-33 in terms of rebounds. That's massive, yeah. man. You know, that, that's big. 12-6 in offensive rebounds. We're getting extra possessions, and these two guys have a lot to do with. But but Jonas Valanciunas, 23 points, 10 of 18 shooting, 15 rebounds, two blocks. That That's like, that is a, that's like a DeMarcus Cousins game. And, yeah, maybe a three in there too, but yeah, and, for sure. And, and and you know what I liked in this game about him is that Kyle Lowry is showing increasing confidence in, in Valanciunas. Like you saw twice where he dumped the ball to JV, kicked it back out, uh, reposition, yeah, and back repost. Up. Like that shows me you're committed to your big man, not the occasional touch once in a while, go take a jumper. Like they're, they're definitely more committed to JV. And I think it's it goes like both ways. Like once he's fighting on the glass – the guards see that they want to reward him for it. It's like a good chemistry between the two. Yeah. It's like it, it's just it's just happening for JV right now. I'm so happy for the guy, man. It's it's really subtle though, but I think you you touched on something interesting. He his reposting after his initial post wasn't successful. Uh, he he's worked hard on that, and he and he's doing that a lot more often. Normally he would just throw that out, and you know he would he would soften up and maybe back away or you know just go in for the rebound, but. In the high school, coach used to just drill that into our heads, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Post up, you, you give it into him. You locate as a shooter. Yeah. You kick it out, and and then you and you get your better position, and then you throw it right back in, and you have a better shot. Yeah. But yeah. but but his his matchup today, man, uh, Mahinmi. Oh my God, he had a horrible game. Like that guy missed. Like I think 
I think he had like three open he missed hooks, all the field goals. which he like front rim and not just front rim, like he, he like yeah, like, he like the top of the ball hit the front rim. Like yeah. it was like it he was shot like a, better from the line, which is weird. Yeah, yeah, five for six on the line. Yeah, he he just had terrible. But pre podcast we talked about how Paul George still scares you, man. What's uh what's going on there? Dude, man, put up twenty eight points in thirty three minutes on fifteen shots. Like he he just he gets really good looks from himself, and he just hits every shot. Like every time he puts a shot up, I'm afraid it's going in. Yeah, and, and he, young Paul Pierce without the trash talk. He and gets, you don't hate him. <laughs> He gets some help from Ellis, <laughs> but other than that, man, he's getting no help from any of the Pacers. Yeah. Like I, nothing. They, I don't know, they man. They have like, nothing I, going on. That team has nothing going for them other than Ellis. Like, I, I mean, the rest of the team shot really well in game one, and we all said that was not going to happen, yeah. probably, uh, consistently at least for the rest of the series. Yeah. But, but Paul George can put this team on his back. Like, we've absolutely forgotten how good of a basketball player he was. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's, it's a shame. Uh, but yeah, he's a, he's he's not he, like you don't like. I, I generally pretty much hate every other every NBA player not playing for the Raptors. But Paul George is a guy that I just can't seem to bring myself to hate. I don't know what it is because he's him. not a dick. He, he doesn't have that attitude. He just goes on and plays at a really high level. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he hate that. Is. Yeah. All right, so um, so that's game two for you. Series tied uh, at one. Uh, game three is in Indiana on Thursday night. Sam, uh, thoughts on Game three? What do you? What, what, well, let's start off with a call. Like, what do you, what do you think is going to happen in Game three in terms of uh, winners versus losers? I think the Raptors are going to win. Yeah. You you, you think they can yeah, take both I, in I Indiana? Called five. Oh, yeah. No, I think I I called five at the beginning of the series, but after Game one, I'm, I readjusted to six. I think I Indiana. To me, and I haven't seen a lot of Pacer games this year, but this feels like the Indiana team that has been consistently playing throughout the year. Yeah. Um, this team cannot beat the Raptors. Even the Raptors, with a DeMar DeRozan who's playing like crap and a Lowry who's not playing Kyle Lowry, you know, 2015-2016 basketball, yeah. they still can't beat us. They don't have depth. They don't have people front to match our, match our bigs. And if you do anything to Paul George to disrupt this game, I'm really happy giving Monte Ellis 20 shots a game. Yeah. I'm really happy. Like, what what I don't get about the Pacers is that is that why they're not playing Jordan Hill a bit more. I'm not not saying he's the savior for them, but given how they're getting crushed on the offensive glass and on Six the defensive fouls, glass, yeah. and Mahimi basically is like not able to finish anything around the rim. He just looks awkward, and there's just no chance in his shots. I mean, you put Jordan Hill in there, maybe you have a little bit more muscle to deal with Valanciunas or Biombo, but without him, I look at their lineup. There is nobody there who even remotely scares you from a physical perspective on the front line. No, but like, like, you know, yeah. I, I think they can do interesting things. Like you play Turner at five, you play Solomon Hill at four. You know, I, in Ellis, Stucky, George, you know, combination of those guys with George Hill or whoever. Yeah. That that lineup gave us a lot of problems, and I think that lineup, um, if they execute well and they rotate defensively well, yeah, they could hurt. You know. Guys like Bismack, they could hurt JV, at least on the offensive end. And from a Pacers perspective, if, if you look at the first two games, um, you know, the Raptors definitely feel that, you know, they didn't play well in either game and they still came out 1-1. No. I think the Pacers might might hold a similar view, um, especially look at game two, which was kind of close until the fourth quarter. Uh, like yeah. They might go into game three thinking, you know, we got a big crowd at home. It's it's a, you know, it's the home of basketball, Indiana. And they, they usually have decent crowds in the postseason. Um, Tough. they haven't been playing well at their home court. Like I wouldn't, like I wouldn't be surprised if they took one of the two games. Um, like my call was the Raptors in seven, but given how poor these guys play as a team, they just don't even play as a team. It's just Paul George and a bunch of guys. Uh, like I can see yeah. the Raptors realistically, like you know, winning one or two games in Indiana and closing this series out in six. Yeah, no, totally. I. I... They need to be feeling good because I don't think they expected to win a game in Toronto. But yeah, you know, we we need to see a plan on Paul George. Like yeah. like I was saying before the podcast, you felt it felt like this should have been the plan for Game One, and the plan for Game Two should have been okay. Now how do we disrupt Paul George, right? Yeah. Like so now we're going back to Indiana yeah. saying how do we disrupt Paul George? Yeah. Feels like a game too late. Maybe maybe it'll work. Yeah. Um. 
So, so j- just some brief uh, things ahead of uh, Game Three. Uh, like, uh, Terrence Ross um, was uh, was Demar Derozan. Not only did he have a crappy game, he also took out Terrence Ross on a. <laughs> he bumped Aaron into headbutt, him, yeah. bumped a headbutt mm-hmm. or whatever it was. The the the, the video is on the site. Uh, Ross was basically taken out as a precaution because they followed the NBA's concussion rules, and he was he didn't play really the second half. Yeah, uh, and um, and uh, so that's that's one injury concern, I guess, from a, from a Raptors perspective. Um, and the one guy that we haven't really talked about, and I we think we should it definitely is Patrick Patterson, man, who has been the most consistent player across two games uh, for the Raptors. Uh, the, today he was five for six field goals, uh, fourteen points, plus twenty one. Uh, that's a team high, uh, and all to go with uh, six rebounds. And also, man, he was you know like fifty fifty balls. All the Raptor yeah. bigs are in there. I think that's a considered effort by Dwayne Casey saying, Indiana bigs don't have it. You guys go crash the boards. You're going to get them half the time. The counter, the counter to that is that we give up a lot of transition points against Indiana, and that's basically the only way they're Horrible. able to score efficiently. But like, given what's happening over the two games so far, I don't mind the Raptors dominating the glass, even if it means giving up a few points on the break. It's, uh, it, it, I think that balance works out in favor of the Raptors. But let me just not go on my rant again. But let's talk about Patrick Patterson, man. Shower him with some love. No, he's, he's playing amazing. He's playing amazing. He's going to get a big payday next year. Uh, his defense is what's most important. His defense, then three-point shooting, in my opinion. Yeah. He's making really tight, really, really like on-the-ball rotations. And he is there to clean up any mess. Uh, the the backcourt makes by you know getting blown by uh, by their man or you know in transition uh, when he makes it back but mostly you know uh, help defense when when like guys like Joseph DeRozan or Lowry have have their guy blow by him mm-hmm. um, which is big because it, it's always nice to know that you have someone behind you who's gonna who's gonna clean up your mess and Patrick Patterson's one of those guys Biombo is definitely one of those guys yeah. Um, and and then he comes back and he you know he dunks in transition or you know he pulls up for a three and he sticks it and that really really makes it difficult for Indiana's bigs. Yeah, and uh, speaking of you know I mean they're energy guys right, and they're sorry and they're energy guys and they're getting beaten to the ball you know at least fifty percent of the time. It's it's deflating. And, and then you step back and hit a train in your eyes right. It's got it's got to hurt. Yeah. And uh, some more quotes coming from uh, post game. Um, uh, per Frank Vogel, uh, Mahimi is day to day with a lower back sprain. That probably helps them more than hurts them. And then he was asked about the, the defense of the Raptors in the fourth quarter. He goes, uh, quote unquote, uh, you don't win 56 games by accident. This is a great defensive team we're playing against. So obviously, uh, some showering some praise. And Dwayne Casey was asked how uh, DeMar DeRozan responded uh, to being bench. And he said, uh, quote, I think he understands that the group was running, rolling pretty well. Uh, unquote. So, um, um, and Kyle Lowry was asked the same thing, and he goes, uh, DeRozan spent the fourth quarter cheering the team on, the sign of a great player, supporting his teammates, a win is a win. Well, yeah, well, what, what are you going to do? You got benched, and you just got to watch and observe and, and maybe hopefully understand like what you're doing wrong. Again, it's, it's the defensive side that con- concerns you more than anything. Man. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if DeRozan is that kind of guy to, you know, hold a grudge in those kinds of situations. I, I truly honestly he wants to win. He's going to do whatever it takes to win. If he's on the court, you know, you, he's going to want the ball in his hands, and if he's not, you know, put someone in, he's going to cheer them on. He didn't look like he was sulking on the bench mm-hmm. uh, from the few shots that we got. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. He's just got to respond now. I think I think the key is he needs to respond in game three, put up like a solid game. Yeah. Uh, some, and give us another option. So some complaints coming from uh, Paul George about the officials. Uh, he goes, uh, really? The, yeah. Well, some minor complaint. He goes, uh, the foul Kyle Lowry drew on me was a cheap foul. Uh, Monty, I'm guessing Monty McCutcheon, the referee, came over and told me he messed up. He messed that one up, but it happens. I don't know why he's uh, that's being brought yeah. up. And for him, he got away. Uh, he got away. And uh, who's it? Curtis Joseph or uh, sorry, Curtis Joseph. Yeah. Corey Joseph or Lowry, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think officials are not a factor in the series at all, man. Uh, overall. It's just frustrating to watch as a fan, I think. You know, it, it's really inconsistent from play to play. You know, either ba- either bury your whistle in your ass or just call freaking everything, you know? I don't, it's I mean... Just, I, I, have, I, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts about NBA for sure. Yeah, but what we all do, and I, I, I don't think it's been even a talking point of the series so far. Um, I, I think the Raptors, no, uh, but, even the Raptors got away with one call today, man. The, the JV went on the repost, the hook yeah. that he had. I mean, it's, it, it goes both ways. I, I just don't think it's been a, been a factor at all. 
Oh no no no! Sorry, I, I wasn't being clear. I, as just a guy who likes watching basketball, having bad officiating disrupt action when it shouldn't disrupt, and then not disrupt when it should disrupt is is annoying. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, you know you know what makes that uh, like doubly annoying when uh, when you have like a like an official like Joey Crawford who wants to be part of the action or like Dick Pavetta who uh yeah. like who 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 think the crowd is there to see them in action but nobody gives a shit. Like yeah. that's that's the most annoying part. What, what I, I'm not sure if we covered this already, but who was the referee yes, uh, for Saturday's game? I don't know. Don't put me on the um, spot, man. Yeah. Sorry. Anyways, someone someone said to me uh, that that referee, the last twelve playoff games that he officiated, the 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 road team has won. <laughs> <laughs> that's a All crazy right. stat, man. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, let's read uh, at uh, – this is a very dangerous thing we're going to do, but let's read the Raptors probably comment section. Let's read the uh, couple of top comments. Uh, we got, we're up to like 335 so far. Uh, so uh, Coach DB goes, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Dwayne Casey earned massive, massive respect for me. To bench DeMar in the fourth quarter was huge. DeMar was making a horrible decision. was hurting the team. Great, great move. So uh, so some love for Dwayne Casey there. And here's Go-Go Wingspan. Well, this is a run-on sentence. He goes – Vasquez was traded for Powell, another first-round pick. Vasquez was traded for Powell, another first-round pick. And he keeps repeating that over and over again until like it's like a paragraph long. Vasquez was traded for Powell and another first-round pick. Oh, it's two second-round picks for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Messiah Julius made some uh, pretty damn good moves, man. And uh, another one goes, mad props to Dwayne Casey for keeping DeRozan on the bench in the fourth despite the internal politics that no doubt say our all-star should be playing. Uh, then he goes expletive, the inevitable dislike. Got nothing yeah. to lose. Yeah. Got nothing to lose. Yeah. Pretty well coached game, Dwayne Casey. Uh, suspicious mind goes, hallelujah. I think he means hallelujah. Uh, Casey grew up as a coach and bench DD. So happy. So a lot of lot of uh, praise for Dwayne Casey uh, from the readers in the uh, in, in in the quick reaction, and uh, and rightfully so. Yeah, they're the best coach games we've seen in a very long time. Yeah. And then uh, JC20 goes, this is what happens when Lowry when you trust the other teammates on the floor. He did watch the tape and he did adjust his game. Hats off to him, um, you know. So Demar Derozan, uh, <laughs> this is good, man. He goes, hats off to him, Demar Derozan, Mister. I'm not going to shoot five for eight nineteen again when five for eighteen. <laughs> 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 oh God. Okay, so Sam, I think I think that kind of rounds off uh, game two. Um, game yeah. three is on Thursday. Uh, it's a big game. Uh, it's not a pivotal game. I think game four is always the pivotal one uh, whenever a series is uh, is is one one. So. Uh, somebody's got to take a series, uh, a two-one series lead on Thursday night, but uh, Game Four will be the one that kind of pivots the series and sees which way it kind of goes. Um, listener, thank you for tuning in to the post-game podcast uh, at Raptors Republic. Do check out our next podcast, which is scheduled to be likely on Thursday or Friday, definitely, uh, with Blake and Will, or I might come back for another podcast. We'll see how it goes. No matter the case, uh, Raptors Republic is your one-stop shop for uh, Raptors playoff coverage. Uh, Sam, thanks again for joining us, man. Thanks, buddy. And listener, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.